level six. Us, we'll see. So, I guess they hopefully. think they're showing us local culture, okay, but I, did this one, I feel so I don't like know. actually no, maybe this is kind of what Dubai is. Mm. I feel like it was just a bunch of bros showing off how rich they were. Yeah, it's like, so glamorous. Actually, no, that, that tracks. That totally tracks with everything I know about Dubai. So I take it back. It was a perfect encapsulation of the local culture. Yeah, uh, I don't know why the Amazing Race wanted to show us this. I think the Amazing Race is kind of... This is the fifth time that they've been to the United Arab Emirates. So mm -hmm. they have done a lot of things in Dubai. And I feel like... Maybe the first time they went, they did a lot more culture-y things that kind of paid homage to the, you know, the ancient origins of this, of this region. And then it just became more and more like, <sighs> here are all the cool toys that all the sweet oil money has built to draw in tourists. And let's yeah, show a different three, cool tourist toy every long. time we go. And they've been skiing One there, and, and they've three. been... They went to the Those water park, so and it's just, like, there's so, so much artifice mm -hmm. with all uh, of these legs. It's, how bad is the elephant? At a certain point, it's how like, bad is you could have done all dung. these tasks just Ooh. not anywhere. Ooh. Right. Uh, I don't know if to shoot there, <clears throat> is this like whoever is green lighting <laughs> the production in the, in, in the UAE is like, uh, if it's not too much trouble... Uh, my kid and his friends would love to be in the show. Could we, could, could we get them on TV? That, that, that would, those guys would, would, would love it. I, I funded this project. It's a giant frame in the middle of Dubai. It's hemorrhaging money. Can you just give us a little bit of screen time? This is more plausible than anything else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So we go from there to the, the giant, the great frame of Dubai, Jess. <laughs> This is a cool looking thing, but I did find it kind of odd that they would say to the cab driver, take me to the great frame, and the cab driver would not know what they were talking about because, <laughs> boy, I don't know what else in Dubai would be called the great frame. <laughs> yeah. A little hard to miss. Yeah. Uh, Mike, it, it seemed like that uh, there was a big problem with get, finding the exit at the great frame. Yeah, I mean, it could be one of those things. I mean, I live in New Jersey. It's one of these weird things where we have, like, jug handles and all these things where the exits are positioned very oddly, where once you get off one, it's really tough to sort of make your way back to things. Maybe that's how they're doing it. I just imagine a giant roundabout in the middle of Dubai that, I don't know, knowing Dubai probably has, like, a big water feature of unicorns sword fighting in the middle of it, that they're just continually going around trying to find the right exit. Though, for what it's worth, it seemed like the only real major tactic Trevor came from the sisters Riley. Everyone else seemed to do at least pretty well navigating. Once they actually got to the task is when things, you know, went a bit pear-shaped. Yeah. Rachel and Alyssa really struggled uh, with their cab driver to get to the exit. Uh, but eventually they got oh. over to the frame and uh, we get set up for our <laughs> detour. Just what, what was the detour called? Um, The detour was... It was... Fall or find, I think. Fall or find, okay. And uh, we saw the Afghanimals, and we saw Colin and Christy. Uh, they were going to go to uh, beat the first teams to go to fall. They wanted they wanted to jump off the building where uh, other teams uh, decided to go for find. And uh, we get the real big swerve here, Jess, that no, you're not actually going to jump out of the building. You're doing virtual reality. Well, I thought this was an interesting... I thought the swerve was interesting. I think other people's mileage have varied a lot. But I thought it was kind of cool because you did have people who have been on the show before applying knowledge of what tasks are typically like and how they know it's going to go. And then they kind of turned it upside down on them. And that was really fun because if you watch the show for any amount of time, you know that those tasks where there are only two slots available, if you're not one of the first people there, you've got to wait for the other people to be done. But if they are jumping off a building, that's going to be pretty quick because, you know, gravity. So... <coughs> It, it uh, absolutely, the line of to... logic, as far as do I take this task or do I take the other task, 
when you see other people uh, already hitting on to the one that you know there's only two slots available, that's all maybe, perfectly maybe, logically maybe sound. Okay. And I'm not mad at it. And <laughs> on the same note, I think I think deciding to switch tasks and go to the one after you you're pretty sure it's gonna take you longer to find the eggs than it is to jump off a building, mm-hmm. that also makes sense. It yeah. just happened that there was this other component and it turned out that the jumping off building task was really this other task that we've seen many, many times on this show. The virtual reality quote unquote training exercise thing. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, the uh, Rachel and Alyssa switching it up once they got to fi- find the eggs because uh, the, to me I-, I didn't think this made a lot of sense because they're already there. They didn't even attempt to go and look for the eggs and they go from like having one foot in the dinosaur costume to switching up the task just huh. you uh, think that this is the right move to switch I don't think it was necessarily the right move to switch at that point mm-hmm. I, I don't think like I think they could have at least tried it or they could have decided right away to go but they hmm. I think it was <sighs> partially like I can get inside of Rachel's head for this yes. because We've seen Rachel race a lot in the past. We know what she's like. I think she thought about how many gifts would exist of her running around in that dino costume Mm -hmm. and she was not about it. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, Rachel is on Big Brother. I think that that, those (laughs) ideas or any sense of, you know, shame is sort of out the window at this point when it comes to wearing crazy costumes. I did not watch Rachel's seasons of Big Brother, so I do not know this, but... How many weird costumes was she in? Because I felt like Nicole was well, right at home. Okay, yeah, so I know I've seen Nicole play the game, and Nicole was in, like, if they forced somebody into an outfit mm-hmm. across her two seasons, it was always her. Right. Nicole, uh, very comfortable in the dinosaur costume. Now, I do think that in uh, terms of the timing of Rachel playing Big Brother uh, seasons 12 and season 13, I, I do think was sort of free gif uh, becoming uh, super mainstream in terms of like uh, being shared on social media so okay. it, I don't think that there are a ton of uh, Rachel gifts and certainly not a ton of Rachel costume gifts Rob, she spent the first HOH of season 13 grabbing onto a giant hot dog being covered in ketchup and mustard <laughs> Wait, is that, oh, is I there did see that one that, that's a gif? I'm sure there's a gif of everything. I'm, I'm sure there's something no, out I'm gonna there. T- I'm going to type in on Twitter Rachel Riley into into the gif. I mean, I mean, I don't think anything has been widestream on behalf of the Riley internet proliferation as much as Alyssa spinning up water in response to something. That's probably the most popular between the two. But yeah. I got to feel like there's some big back and a lot of Rachel Riley gifts in there because she's great television as she's proved in these couple of episodes where they were they were taking the struggle bus a bit and the struggle bus mixed their exits. Yeah. Times over the course of these well, two let me just, I, I just I just Google image searched this. Yeah. I, I Google image searched Rachel Riley GIF, and she looks stunning in all of them. Yeah. On Twitter, if you look for Rachel Riley uh, as a GIF, uh, there's a lot of her crying, but it is uh, mostly this Amazing Race season. Uh, it seems like that's what uh, is like her and Alyssa dancing. So there's not a ton of uh, Big Brother stuff for. Uh, there's a Rachel like shock face. Uh, I forget what exactly uh, that was in regards to. Maybe that some that Brendan was going to come back into the house, but. Um, yeah, no costumes. It's weird that the first thing that comes up when you search Rachel Riley and Twitter gifts is a gif of Brittany. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I have Ian Terry in a dog costume uh, from uh, just one season later. I don't know why that shows up in the Rachel Riley. Uh, but <laughs> that lets, we've, we've digressed. We're, we're well, well off the beaten path like uh, Rachel Melissa's cab driver. So uh, the finding the uh-huh. glowing eggs task, this did not seem that difficult, Mike. Uh-huh. This was so stupid. Like, I'm so surprised that you were, like, slamming this this Vive uh, fall side of the detour. Because, yes, I do agree that the swerve, I totally agree with Jess, that I do not resent the decision that the Riley sisters made because I think the Amazing Race very rarely does these types of swerves. So I think they totally were using conventional wisdom. Like, oh, yeah, people are going to jump off things quickly, so by the time we get there, we, we, there won't be any sort of backlog. We'll be able to jump off. But, I mean... 
It is crazy to think, you know, I think when we, Rob, you and I talked a couple seasons ago about the infamous task in Norway <laughs> where they had to take the fireworks to the trolls and read them a poem. <laughs> I thought we had reached peak absurdity. No, I don't know exactly if we've reached it here with running around in dinosaur costumes collecting colored, like an infinity stone eggs <laughs> from the Jurassic Park clone that's popped up in Dubai. <laughs> this has to be pushing that uncanny valley right now. <laughs> this didn't bother me as much as virtual reality because, <laughs> yeah, that we this was advertised as being stupid, uh -huh. and it was stupid, whereas the other thing was advertised <laughs> as being epic and then was stupid. <laughs> the stupid you know is better than the stupid you don't. Yeah, the glowing eggs uh, di didn't bother me, and I like getting to see everybody in... Uh, the I'm here for all the Amazing Race costumes, Jess. Yeah, you know, the first time I ever saw that dino costume, I mean, now everybody has one. Like, I, I think they just sort of magically appear in your closet now. If, like, I went to my closet right now, I'd probably find one in the back of it. But the first person I know who ever had one of those uh, was... Beth from the Roller Derby Moms in Amazing Race 22. Yeah. And her social media for about a year was just her doing everyday tasks in that dino suit, and it was hysterical every time she did it. Okay, so is this a, is this a switchback then? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Uh, answer this question. Uh, between Becca and Floyd, how many uh, dinosaur no. costumes do they own? 26. <laughs> Yeah, listen, they're living in Colorado, and not to make too much of like a drag race superfluous connection, but one Evie Oddly also wore a children's dinosaur costume on the runway this season. So maybe the children's dinosaur costume is like given out to each and every citizen of Colorado to just wear at your convenience. Maybe, maybe. Uh, also, I believe that uh, magic mushrooms have uh, now been legalized. <laughs> was was Spencer wearing a dinosaur costume when he podcasted with you early in the season? <laughs> No, he was not. He was not. Um, so did, when Corinne moved to Denver, did she get a dinosaur costume? I think she has one. I don't know if she's worn it yet. I, I feel like we're also losing the fact that Dubai has for some reason decided to invest in a dinosaur park. Like, this is just they wild. They don't want to buy, make next in Dubai. They were thinking so much about what they could do, they didn't think so much about what they should be doing. <laughs> Well, the dinosaurs uh, find a way. Like. <laughs> oh my god. They they spared every expense for this place. Yeah, yeah, if on. there ever is a real life Jurassic <laughs> Park, it will be in Dubai. It's it's true. I, I gotta be honest though, like I have huh. been to a thing in Vegas that looks almost exactly like this dino park, except it was Christmas themed, not dino themed. So I, again, Dubai is just like Vegas but more extra. Yeah. Um, it seemed like just the only trouble anybody had was that for Janelle and Brittany, that they didn't know what the dinosaur nest was supposed to be, and it looked like that they were throwing their eggs in a garbage can. <laughs> Is that a garbage can? I don't know what they were, they were throwing their eggs in. It looked like a bigger egg. <laughs> it looked like, yeah, but some receptacle that was definitely not where they were supposed to be putting their eggs. Can we also talk oh, yeah. about, like, why are there lounge chairs shaped like pandas in the dinosaur park? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they're complaining a lot of history with this park to begin with. Just go with it. They all live together. Yeah. Um, I did, like, <laughs> hear, Mike, where uh, Brett was calling out Chris for his quote-unquote annoying Oklahoma accent. Yes, I love it. I think if we ever needed to know what the Cambridge High School production of Oklahoma would sound like, I think we found the answer here with Brett. <laughs> I mean, in fairness, I would imagine that Brett's mockery of Chris's accent is like, it's like the one time he did this as opposed to the 900,000 times Chris did it back to him. <laughs> well, Boston's recently voted the sexiest accent, so I think Brett's sort of like negging the Oklahoman accent. He has, he has the higher ground now. Where was Long Island on that list, Mike? <laughs> I don't know if it made the list. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you guys know what the, world's, what the world's sexiest accent is? Hmm. What is it? Uh, apparently it's New Zealand. Oh. Oh, good news for Phil. Exactly. Although Phil's accent's all over the place these days. <laughs> okay. 
So uh, teams are going to be having trouble uh, with the test, uh, Jess. Uh, people could not seem, uh, the Afghanimals especially, to get on the same page with the five-question virtual reality test. Are we sure they know what an antenna is? It seems like they like struggled with that. Yeah, they, they knew what they were looking for. After you failed the test the first time, you know what to look for. And they kept getting that question wrong. Yeah. Well, I, th I think at one point they confused the satellite for the antenna. So I think at one point they were just pointing at objects around the room and like, all right, I guess that's the thing. It's like the, the meme of the butterfly. Is this an, an antenna receptor? <laughs> you know, that's not the first time. I, that, that is not the last time we're going to reference that meme in this podcast, just so you know. Okay. All right. So... The teams would end up going from these tasks uh, to the silent rave. Silent rave where everybody wears their own Bluetooth headphones uh, for the rave. And the teams were required to send somebody in to see uh, what, who's dancing to the right beat. First, Jess, silent rave. This is a thing. Um, yeah, this is a thing. This is something, I know they have them in New York. I don't know if they're raves per se, but I know that uh, the group Improv Everywhere had a party where you would download an MP3 file and go to Central Park, and then you'd all listen to the file together, and, like, it was a group experience. Mm -hmm. Should this be the, the a theme of the next live know-it-alls? Um, so how is that to work exactly? <laughs> They're going to record a podcast beforehand, and you're going to say, okay, yeah. everyone hit play at the same time, and we'll, everyone will just sort of sit in their own corner and listen and react together. Make sure everybody's on one X. <laughs> exactly. Don't listen ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not going to that. I don't listen. I don't listen to any slower than 1.5 x. <laughs> okay, maybe if everybody can agree to be, maybe there'll be like a 1.5 x <laughs> section and a 2 x. Yeah, like section. a VIP section of a club, like the 2 x section, the 1.7 section. Yeah, if you're in a hurry, you need to get out of there by 9:45. You can listen to 2 x. Yeah, and then like off in the corner is Taryn Armstrong listening to everything on 3 x. Yeah. Okay, so. Silent Rave, Mike, uh, I thought that this was uh, at least uh, tr trending in the right direction from the uh, detour. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, this is another thing, I guess, an advantage of the nightlife stuff is that you can do this type of thing. I, first of all, the Amazing Race theme remix, they need to release that because that is a bop and a half. Uh, I absolutely love that as a longtime fan of that theme song. Uh, and I thought that, you know... I don't know how this happened, but, I mean, this is, like, Floyd's season. Floyd <laughs> crushed this task just like he crushed the karaoke task and the dancing task. Like, I don't know if it just so happens that this season they're doing more musically-based tasks, but Team Fun is raking in, like, all the benefits of it. Yeah, just it seems like that people were either really good at this or really bad at this. Well, I think there was a trick to it, and I think somebody, like, this is obviously, like, this task is made for someone who's ever been a drum major, mm -hmm. but I also think it was just a matter of, like, kind of internalizing the beats per minute and then seeing who was moving to that speed, and it looked like there was a fair number of people that had that track in their headphones. Mm -hmm. Or you just pick the guy that looks weird with the top knot and hope that he's <laughs> one of them, which he was. Yeah, well, I think the biggest obstacle was that this was a room full of white people. Yes. So I'm not sure you could necessarily count on all of them to be finding the beat. Uh, <laughs> um, what did you think, Mike? Was uh, was Chris being unfair when he said that Brett was just uh, looking for the cute guys and grabbing all the cute guys in the club? Listen, they're in the desert. He can't help it if he's, if he's thirsty, Rob. <laughs> They're away for a long time. Uh, I mean, maybe Chris was trying to strike back at Brett for making fun of his accent, but I mean, I'll ask you, I'll turn the question back on to you, Rob. Speaking of live know it alls, yes. is Brett now perma banned from karaoke, <laughs> considering between the karaoke task and now this, his his sense of musicality has decreased no. significantly from preseason expectations. He always has he always has a place as long as he wants to sing so but I don't know if I can put him in charge of picking people out to ask questions, so <laughs> that's true. Okay. Exactly. He's gonna she's he's not he's, he's very biased. He's just going to, might just pick out the, the cute guys. Uh, and Jess, I also thought that it was a, Chris was too hard on Brett when he said he's just standing there like an idiot. Yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta process everything that's happening around you. 
Yeah. And sometimes sometimes that looks like standing there like an idiot. <laughs> I, I did love, because I, I think of the two people, I would want to see Brett be more uh, react <laughs> exasperatedly to the reaction to a sign, right? And that's pretty much what he did, right? It's like, what the hell is this? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I love Brett LaBelle's uh, internal monologue that comes out. <laughs> it's just, I, I'm so happy that the two of them not only have been surviving through, but they've significantly picked up their games. Yeah. That means they're hopefully in for the long haul, because I feel like their characters have become so flushed out. And I mean, the bromance, what Chris has been perpetuating in his hat, we're really starting to see it, like the back and forth between them. Now that the, the packs sort of thinned out a little bit, we get to see more of these types of teams. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that they've been doing well and that they've been shown more as a result. Yeah, I'm ecstatic. Jess, somehow Brett and Chris uh, went from, like, uh, they were like the dodos in the first couple of weeks, and now they've sort of, like, leveled up to where they're, like, uh, right there with the rest of the pack. I mean, we've had teams like that before that sort of, like, bumble their way through a couple of legs and then they start to figure it out. And I think that kind of growth arc is always really satisfying for people to watch. Yeah. So it's been very fun. And uh, they ended up with, uh, again, two strong finishes uh, coming on the heels of the third place finish last week. Yeah. So, you know, they couldn't mm -hmm. finish in first. Had the other person probably picked the task, but I guess Brett was able to overcome his fear of musically based tasks, and he was able to re re redeem himself to Chris next time. Though maybe just because there weren't any cute drummers while they were doing the head to head in the next lane. Yeah, uh, there were a couple other people that were really good at this. Uh, Leo also was able to uh, come right in. Uh, I think that between Leo and Jamal. Jess, am I crazy to think that Leo is uh, the better player than uh, of Leo and Jamal? I don't know if I would say better player, but I feel like we've talked about this a lot, and I think it's less prevalent on All-Star seasons, but how with many Amazing Race seasons, you have two team members, and one of them is kind of the standout personality, and one of them is kind of the dud. Yeah. And I feel like this is the first season where it's really been apparent that Leo is kind of the alpha afghan animal, mm -hmm. and Jamal is all right. He seems like a nice guy. I'm sure he's great, but Leo's the one that gets the majority of the funny lines, and he kind of does the memorable mm -hmm. tasks, and he's kind of the first one you think of. Yeah, I feel like the Jamal has like more bluster, but then Leo comes in and aces most of the tasks that uh, he takes part in, where I feel like Jamal struggles might. I mean, we'll see that next episode where, you know, he definitely struggles with the Rolex. It's also maybe a thing where since their second time on the race, you know, Jamal has become a father. Maybe parenthood has sort of brought his personality down a bit, whereas Leo is single and ready to mingle to quote another person who hung onto that giant hot dog back in Big Brother. And so he's uh, more unbridled with energy. I'll have to sort of take a look at it because... I would say when it came to the extraness mm -hmm. that I complained about with the Afghan Wolves a couple ah. episodes ago, the primary culprit, from my opinion, was Leo, who seems to be just more energetic and all over the uh -huh. place. But I do see your point that, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to task balance, maybe it's more weighted in Leo's favor. Though I do not think it's the, uh, the, the most unbalanced team in the race. Yeah. So... Some people were struggling with it, uh, of course. Uh, we saw Brett uh, was struggling with it. It seemed like that uh, Christy was another person that struggled. Well, yeah. I mean, we already know she's not a dancer. Yeah, not like Colin. Whoa, well, Jess, what was that? I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm not sure what's happening with them at all ever anymore. Just, just they're sucking the juice out of everything. That's why Colin had to not take to task. He had to suck the juice out of that nightclub. <laughs> All right. Is, is Colin a vampire? Is that why they're having so many night legs? Are they accommodating his disability? I mean, uh, he was out of control at the dance club. <laughs> See, this is where, like, you think that, oh, the angry Colin went away. No, he just got displaced. He's put himself fervently into his dancing and he's just made himself calm the rest of the time. So you put him on the dance floor, and he's going to let loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's expressing himself through the power of dance. <laughs> exactly. He's found a healthy outlet. I, I like it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Rachel and Alyssa are uh, starting to get the sense that this m might not be their leg, and they might be headed towards a last place finish, and... Mike, uh, Rachel is uh, starting to lose a little bit uh, on, on the way over. 
Oh my god, this is fantastic editing. I love this so much. And it seems like Rachel did as well. I've seen her, you know, like a bunch of comments on social media about it, but it's so fantastic. And they have to cut back to it a few times, but Rachel essentially being, uh, you know, in tears, weeping over the fact that this is it, my time in the amazing race has come to the end, cut to Eliza, just completely, you know, no selling it, like, Rachel, please stop it. We need to keep going. Nothing's happened yet. So she, I love how she was trying to be optimistic at first and then just plainly turned to, like, please stop being hysterics. This uh, just... The pairing between the two of them made for a fantastic comedic edit that I, I love that we got sort of peppered in throughout the, the last few minutes of this leg. Yeah. I mean, Rachel Jess is really going to be, like, talking herself into, like, uh, all right, we're going to lose, but, you know, it is, it, it's okay. We had a great yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got two observations here. And observation number one, it sure seemed like Elisa Aly- shut her down a lot faster than Brendan would have in the same scenario. So I think I think she, the sisters have that going for them. Yes. And thing number two, this was as vicious a shutdown as Sansa Stark <laughs> shutting down Edgar Tully. <laughs> sit down, Rachel. Yeah, sit down, Rachel. Sit down, sister. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I'm here, like, I want, I want a master compilation of, like, all of the greatest shutdowns. <laughs> and these two are, like, number two and number one. Yeah. Uh, I do think that Alyssa handled it differently than uh, we've seen Brendan in this spot in the past. Yeah. But like, yes, shout out to my coworker who spells her name identically to <laughs> Alyssa, but she pronounces it Elisa, and it keeps tripping me up, and that's why I keep mispronouncing her name, so... That's what's going on there. <laughs> shout, don't out, at me. shout out, Elisa. Well, maybe I don't know. Maybe you could call one of them something else. Like I believe Rachel called Alyssa last episode Lily. So if you want to Lily. call her Lily, that might help. Okay, that doesn't help. <laughs> or Lila. <laughs> Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> All right, let's get, let's talk about the zip line. Jess, and I, I didn't like the zip line either because to me, like, this wasn't a task. It was just like a it, it was just like a thing you couldn't pass anybody and you couldn't screw it up. Yeah, it's another thing that you could do in Dubai that costs two hundred bucks. <laughs> well, listen though, we do live in an amazing race universe where they did have this type of task at the end of season fifteen, and someone did freak out and let another team pass them and got eliminated. So it's not outside the realm of possibilities that I, I one team so. would freak out at the heights and then say, "Okay, I guess Rachel and Alyssa have to pass us, and therefore we're we're finishing in last." But it was like Team Fun got to the zip line like a half step before Brett and Chris, and then it was like, "Okay, well they're." They're the in, in first now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's no way that anybody could pass them. Right. Well, I mean, it's essentially just it's. I mean, I'm pretty sure when they the the rug that they stepped on that was like five dollars <laughs> in dress barn was uh, essentially dress like barn. a, a de facto, or I guess pro pottery barn. I'm R I P dress barn <laughs> uh, was was a de facto mat for the leg. Mm-hmm. Where, like you said, it was just sort of a nice little epilogue on the end of it. But I don't know. I think it was a way to do it in style, at least to watch Floyd shriek his head off like a banshee, which I probably would do in the same case, was was a lot of, for lack of a better term, fun to watch at the end. Okay, well, Team Fun is going to be in first place, and uh, they are going to uh, present an award to Phil, the Philometer, Jess. What, what's your Philometer at right now, Jess? Um, are we talking before or after I had to watch Phil rap? <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> he was snapping like he's one of the four seasons while he's trying to lay down a rap. It's so dad-like, and I loved it. In the off-season, <sighs> Phil is um, in the swing cast of the Christchurch New Zealand production of Jersey Boys. <laughs> Ooh, the sexiest production. Wait, was Phil prepared for that? No. I don't think so, considering I he rhymed not. one with one. Okay. <laughs> do we want do we want to listen to Phil's rapping? I think we have to now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Welcome to United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is Team Fun. And they are telling us right now. What's one thing that we all want? Money! Yes. <laughs> Five down. Eight. And the 
fun meter right now is where? This is your opportunity to earn your very own fill o meter and all you gotta do is join us in the freestyle circle. Okay, the freestyle <laughs> circle is what we call it. Here we here we go. Do you think the greeter had to do it as well off camera? <laughs> maybe, yes. maybe, perhaps. Okay. Hey, uh, 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 do 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 <laughs> it doesn't exactly scan for Floyd. He could have just said, Team Fun just proved they're gonna win the race. <laughs> that scans is better. What, what do we think about, because we've seen a lot of freestyling from Team Fun yeah. this yeah. season. Is, is, are we still like, are we still liking it, or should we pull a Wendell Holland and tell them to drop the mic? <laughs> yeah. You can't rap. <laughs> Put the mic down, bro. I think it's great. I love it. <laughs> Stop rapping. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're good. Maybe Phil should put the mic down. Just yeah, Phil. <laughs> Phil is trash at rapping. <laughs> Stop rapping. You're trash. Yeah, he didn't even finish his rhyme. He just said he just said with five thousand dollars, what they're gonna do, and then just didn't finish the thought. Well, he can't answer that, Mike. Only they can answer that. Yeah, that's true, because what, what's the best thing there? What did he ask them? Are, are they just going to do the zip line again? <laughs> the, the philometer is at trash right now? Yes. <laughs> or the philometer is at noble right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. On a scale of uh, noble to, I don't know, uh, Belky. He's on the noble. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so the other teams are going to come in. Chris and Brett, uh, number two, stealing the the traditional uh, Victor and Nicole spot. Jess, um, I think this is great, um, and I'm mostly saying I think this is great because I am super excited about the fact that the top two teams are two of the teams in my draft. Oh. So I'm, I actually, I have jumped what? ahead. I am leading I by 15 lot. whole points right now because <laughs> my team is so ridiculously stacked at the moment. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I might call an early winner for you at the moment. You have Tyler Corey too, right? So like, you got some, you got some solid teams. Uh, I mean, Phil might have to write a rap for you about finishing first in the draft when all is said and done. <laughs> Phil isn't going to write me a rap after I told him he was trash at rapping. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. So then uh, we end up with uh, Colin and Christy. Uh, they're in third place. Uh, we're going to see uh, more teams uh, continuing to arrive. Uh, oh, th- uh, Rob, what did you think about Victor showing off his luscious locks? Did yeah. you feel like a, a pang of sadness considering when he shaved that all off to propose to Nicole yeah. a year later? Well, Phil is like, uh, Victor, oh, let's see that luscious hair. You should have a shampoo commercial. But yeah, it's like, okay, well, we know where, we know where this is going. Victor, <laughs> for some reason, cut off his hair and is now an unrecognizable person. Yeah, if you were expecting a happy ending to that hair, you haven't been paying attention. Oh, no. Yeah. And Sia didn't even give him $15,000 to yeah. do it. Oh, Sia could have given me that money and I could have got fifteen k Nick. Oh, man. Babe, Sorry. it's yeah. okay. Babe, babe, oh, no. Don't worry, but there are more people in this house than there are in my town. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, how many lots times this episode did she say how many people live in her town? Yeah, yeah lots of oobly shout-outs in this one. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're going to end up with uh, Rachel and Alyssa, you know, head- heading down to the mat. Uh, Rachel's really going to uh, uh, pre-eulogize her team uh, qu- quite a bit, Mike. Yeah, I mean, this is what happens when you bring in previous racers. They do Phil's work for them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they know the narrative, and uh, they've been racing so well, but it's a not elimination line. So, how do we feel about this? I feel like it's not uncommon for the race to do, you know, every other leg a non elimination leg, but it feels like three and five might just be a tad too early in the season structure, because now we're going to have only one more non elimination leg for the entire back half of the season, though, Rob, I feel like you're totally fine with that. 
Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, get him out of the way early. Yeah, it's going to move now. It's yeah. going to be, like, there's there's all those, like, middle legs where you can't remember exactly how many teams <laughs> are left. You're like, is it <sighs> seven or is it eight? I can't quite remember. And now it's like every week we're going to knock someone off. It's just going to, it's going to go by so fast. <sighs> I mean, you didn't bring back all-star teams from these shows to, you know, save your non-elimination legs yeah, yeah. for when there's less teams. So I kind of feel like uh, use them here up front and maybe uh, have another one in the next two weeks. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, I, uh, I this is your point especially, that from that perspective, I kind of wish there was a non-elimination in the first leg, mm-hmm. but considering that would mean like Martin JJ in a full-body cast walking through the rest of the race, maybe that wouldn't have worked. But I do see, especially with a stacked cast like this, keep them together mm-hmm. as much as possible. Though, of course, tinfoil hat people out there on the internet being like, oh, Rachel and Alyssa saved again, uh, you know, because you know, the race wants them in there. I'll repeat what Jess said a couple weeks ago when we talked about the non-elimination for, like, for the first time. These are predetermined by production. They just happen to get very lucky that, you know, on a bad day, they happen to come zip line into a leg where there was a non-elimination at the end, and they live to race another day. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say about the first leg of this two-hour episode? Well, I've got some Amazing Race 101 to talk about. I think this it fits right, quite nicely in the middle here because we kind of saw two instances of this happening. We got a few questions, so let's cue up the soundbite. Amazing Race 101. Thank you, George. Um, and so I want to talk to this Amazing Race 101 segment. I want to talk about cabs. Because this is something that a lot of people ask about, and I think if you've been watching from the beginning, you kind of take this as a given. But if you're just tuning in this season and this is your first rodeo, you probably don't quite understand what's going on here. Uh, So teams, when they are on the ground in the cities, it used to be that teams would have to arrange all of their own transportation, like flights and everything. And now that's a little bit, that's gone a little bit out the window, except that when they are on the ground in a city... Teams are responsible for getting themselves around, and so they are responsible for retaining their own cabs. And this is probably the number one reason that teams get eliminated, is they end up, just dumb luck, they choose the wrong cab driver, and I would say, like, 90% of unfair eliminations, like ones where you think those guys really got screwed, it is at the hands of a bad cab driver. Mm -hmm. And a really good cab driver can help you quite a bit. Somebody that really knows the area and is fast and knows good shortcuts, they can save you a lot of time. Um, And a lot of them are really game to be on the show and to be into helping you out. But then every so often you get somebody who maybe it's their first day on the job, you don't really know, and they take the wrong road, they get you stuck in traffic. A lot of times you see a cab driver stop with gas, and you're like, don't you understand, we're going to race here. And you've seen a lot of teams go out solely due to the fact that their cab driver wasn't totally on the ball. Is there anything, any telltale signs uh, to be able to spot a good cab driver from a bad cab driver, Jess? Um, That's a really good question, Rob. I would say that... A really good cab driver <laughs> is going to be someone, I would say, go for the person that's driving the janky cab, because that cab's been on the road for a long time, mm. and the driver's probably also been on the road for a long time. Mm. Yeah, that's like, a, what, like, big hat, no cattle? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and here's an interesting piece. This isn't really mm. Amazing Race 101, but it was something I wondered about, because we saw that Janelle and Brittany... And Rachel and Alyssa both had female cab drivers. And they're both wearing, like, the pink headscarves. And I wondered about that, and I looked it up, and it turns out that there is, like, a separate taxi line at the airport um, in Dubai for women. And if you're women traveling alone or two women traveling together, you can have a female cab driver. And all the female cab drivers wear this pink hijab to distinguish that they are cab drivers. No, does a woman have to have a woman cab driver, or that you can uh, have the option that if you don't feel safe uh, going off in with with one of these uh, male cab drivers? Well, that I was less clear on. Um, I do think that 
the Emirates are a lot more uh, stratified when it comes to gender lines, so it wouldn't surprise me to <laughs> find out that they want women with um, female craft drivers, but I think it is more on the passenger side that they can choose to have a female cab driver uh, for safety reasons. Okay. Because that would be a way raw deal if Rachel and Alyssa were forced to use a, a specific cab driver, and then that's what caused them to uh, be eliminated if this was a, not a non-elimination. But for what it's worth, I believe Team Fun also had a similar type of cab driver, if I'm remembering uh, the pink headscarf correctly, and they finished in first. So I feel like even within that system, it's the luck of the draw. I actually, another tidbit that I heard that actually Corinne and Eliza tipped me off in my exit interview with them uh, if you are looking for a cab and you're able to be a bit picky, make sure when you look at the cab that their gas gauge is full. Oh. Because you, you don't want them to stop for gas in the middle. And to Jess's point, it could take a little bit of a while. If they're sort of taking their time with things. You want to make sure they have as full of a tank as possible so that there's no distractions or stopping points along the way to get you where you need to go. Hmm. Okay. All right, before we get into talking about the second hour of the Amazing Race, uh, let me thank our sponsor here that's the open fit all the workouts uh -huh. and nutrition information totally free more fun than anything you're going to do in dubai again just text the word rob to 30 30 30 standard message and data rates may apply all right let's move on to our second leg of the amazing race and we are off uh -huh. to uganda jess it's a brand new country for the amazing race so that's exciting that's that's exciting, but Tyler and Corey recognize uh, right up front that there are reasons that they are not excited about Uganda, Mike. Yeah, so a bit of a background on this. So they, they talked about this a bit, but I believe, I believe that uh, Uganda government has uh, persecution laws in effect that essentially persecute against homosexuality, uh, at least from a practicing format. You can't really be out in terms of the activities that you do or you'll face a, a certain penalty by law. And not to throw too much shade at them, but it has been pointed out by people online after the mm -hmm. fact that the place they happen to be coming from in Dubai does not exactly have the cleanest record when it comes to those types of human rights, either. I mean, I guess what you can say about all this, I can understand why they put it in here, because this <sighs> is Tyler and Corey's really big leg. They even say, hey, it would be great if we end up winning this leg here in a country that essentially does not allow people like us to behave in our natural ways. Uh, so I can understand why, from a story perspective, they put it in here and maybe not really mention it in Dubai. It's a little odd that it wasn't really, you know, uh, mentioned even by Phil's, like, a PSA at the end. But this was a fantastic leg for Tyler and Corey, and I'm glad that, that everything meant so much to them and that the Amazing Race stars aligned to have them finish in first year. Because I agree, not only was it extremely meaningful for them to have a victory here, but also for them to sort of get the cultural experience to realize, hey, maybe, you know, we judge this country by the laws that we see from an external perspective, but internally... There are people in here who are good, who might not exactly be in agreement with these horrible things that are happening. It just, and we saw uh, Corey especially uh, very affected by this, uh, even on the way to Uganda. Yeah, well, this is something, um, I think I have a few more theories of why we got this narrative in this country at this moment. And um, one of the things is that on Tyler's YouTube channel a couple of years ago, he actually, Tyler is someone who is very well known for his LGBT activism and he is he is an advocate for uh, equal rights and he did a series where he interviewed refugees from various countries and he did speak to some teenagers from Uganda who had left the country uh, fearing for their lives because they were gay and so this is something that kind of I think hits close to home for them particularly like not only who they are personally but it's something that they are a little familiar with the laws. Um, and also, they've been to Dubai before. I think they knew what to expect. And they, I believe, uh, my understanding is that the Amazing Race crew has a person who is dedicated to security on the ground wherever they're going and briefs every team on what to look out for. And this was something they had been briefed on in both countries, that um, homosexuality is still a crime in both places. And that it's something they need to be aware of. And they had gotten that warning the first time they went to Dubai in their last season. And so when they went to Dubai, I think they were already a little comfortable 
because they knew they knew how the people would be. They know what the culture is like. They know most of it is very westernized. And I think they felt a little more comfortable in their own skin because they had run a leg of the race there before. But then they get to Uganda, and it's a little culture shock, but without this on top of it. And they're not sure exactly how it's going to go. Like, they know that these laws are in effect, but they don't know, like, how heavily they're enforced necessarily or what the criteria would be, how would they, you know, how would anybody even know? And I think that kind of puts them a little on edge. I can understand exactly why they would feel that way um, going into the leg and getting that warning. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is going on there. I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think the editors or Tyler and Corey intended to single Uganda out. And not for nothing, they won a trip to Singapore, which P.S. has those exact same laws on the books. So not a great week for uh, progressive policies for the LGBTQ community. So anyway, I, I think all of this is to say I don't think we should fault either the editors or Tyler and Corey for bringing this up in one place, but not another. I, if anything, it is the editors that are responsible for that, ultimately. Uh, but... Wait, is, is anybody we, saying, oh, well, hey, how come Tyler and Corey don't say anything in, in Dubai? Oh, yeah. This is, oh, yeah. It's shame on you people. Shame on, shame on you. That's ridiculous. You don't know what's what they say. They also weren't exactly... Like, mm-hmm. They don't exactly have a list up of, okay, huh. well, these are all these countries that have, you know, criminal offenses uh, against being LGBTQ+. Yeah, one. Plus. I think that, to your point, Jess, you know, they obviously knew of this stuff in Dubai, but I think Tyler mm-hmm. has such a personal connection to mm-hmm. Uganda that they knew how special it was huh. to touch down there in particular. So I also wonder if this was affected by the fact that I'm pretty sure these two episodes were not meant to be together, considering that we saw it. Yes. Sometimes with these two-hour blocks, they usually just cram them together and just sort of show them as one big thing. But this really seemed like two separate episodes. Yeah, like with a next, on. Yeah. yeah, like next time on, yeah. previously on. Yeah. If you don't remember what you saw five minutes ago. So I feel like if they separate, you know, this, if there was a separate episode or separate six days or so between these two episodes, it might be a little uh, less egregious. But yeah, I would say to all the people out there who are trying to <laughs> at Tyler and Corey and saying, like, why aren't you talking about what's going on in Dubai? Yeah, like, the, 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 don't, no need to do that. There are other <laughs> things to get angry about that are much more important. It is not their fault. And I'm, I'm happy that in the first place they were able to bring up these things considering how important they are. It was a good moment. I think it was worth reflecting on. And you know, if you want to start doing that, you could unpack something about just about every place they've been and every place they will go, um, including our own country. So maybe we don't want to go down that road. Maybe this is not the show that is. But every uh, once in a while, I think it's important to highlight. Right. Okay. So we are off to Uganda, and uh, the teams are going to be uh, heading out to the taxi station, and they are off to go to the mosque. And now, Jess, it seems as though Tyler and Corey, a uh, very, very smart team, always well prepared, seemed like that they, they knew that there was going to be a possibility of that they might have to know the steps, uh, but maybe they got too cute. Maybe a little. Maybe a little bit. Did the Amazing Race know that this is a thing that people, like, look on Wikipedia and see, oh, 304 steps, so they mark off, like, a uh, a random number of steps? Well, I think it's more like that was a lot of steps and maybe too many to rely on people to count correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that sweet spot is somewhere in around the 300 step range and there were a lot more steps than that. Mm -hmm. That's my only thought, but I do think there have been enough challenges where if you open an amazing race clue and it tells you to walk up some steps Mm -hmm. and answer a question at the top, I think you should know by now what that question is going to be. Unless you're Brent and Chris. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's that. They don't know. It, it, to be fair to Brett and Chris, like, uh, you know, uh, amazing race experts, they are not. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it was just, you know, they've been doing a great job, but I still think there still might be a minor separation of experience between these amazing race teams and the others concerning that get another not amazing race team went home here. And unfortunately, we saw it here firsthand where Brett and Chris just sort of rushed ahead, ran up the stairs. Chris was, uh, you know, yelling in his 
caustic Oklahoman accent to get Brad's, uh, Brett's ass up there. And by the time they got up there, they realized, oh, not only did we miss the clue, but the clue also said we had to count the steps instead of just taking them two at a yeah. time. So they didn't, they didn't, even, they didn't get the clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, lots of recounting uh, for them. Some of these teams are going to get it on the uh, first try, like Nicole and Victor, Colin and Christy. Uh, they're also going to nail it. But Jess, uh, Janelle and Brittany, more problems with taxi cabs. Um, yeah, well, this is actually, uh, this was kind of insane. Like, it looked like the taxi cab wasn't even in the same part of town for most of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because we didn't see any kind of traffic for anybody else, so I don't know right. exactly what route that taxi was taking. They were, like, swimming yeah. upstream. Yeah. Seems like it was It was a weird edit, though, because it seemed like they did get there last, but then they beat a couple teams to the market, so maybe their taxi driver uh. found another way. But yeah, it, it was odd mm -hmm. that, apparently, according to this edit, they were the uh. only team to experience this standstill traffic, where apparently they were just sitting there the entire time while I think they said in a secret scene that like the bigger cars own the road so I guess this poor taxi cab was just getting bullied by larger vehicles of transport uh, and they just had to sort of sit there and take it and wait for an opportunity to uh, to wiggle their way through that just happened to really put them in the back of the pack okay so Rachel and Alyssa were gonna also uh, struggle with the step counting here Mike <laughs> Yeah, so this is almost like part two of the quiz thing, where I guess an unintended consequence of the quiz was that you have the mm -hmm. team members sort of quibble over, okay, uh. which is which one of us has the correct answer? We saw that with the Afghanimals, and we see it here, where I believe both times Alyssa was in the right, and Rachel was unfortunately in the wrong, and huh. Rachel decides to acquiesce here after nearly having to go back and do it again, but they <laughs> do wind up getting the step count here by listening to Alyssa get them that much quicker to do some laundry. <laughs> they were uh, way off on uh, one of their earlier guesses. Yeah, I forgot what they said. Yeah, but I don't... 40 or something? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, 270 versus 272 makes sense. I guess they didn't know whether you should count the step with a red stripe on it, Jess, but uh, it seemed like that they uh, really uh, got a little uh, careless with the step counting the first time. I could see, like, being wildly wrong in the other direction. Like, maybe you didn't see the markers or something like that. Yeah. But it, it seems like no. it would be very hard to skip 30 <laughs> steps. And then there was a point where I, I feel like they didn't realize they were both supposed to be counting. And it's like, if you're both going up those stairs and they want you to give them a correct number... You should both be counting, and then you should check it against each other, and it didn't seem like they did that every time That's either. good. That, that's, that's a good idea. All right. Uh, let's go off to the uh, Soweto restaurant. Uh, Jess, uh, we get a lot of this on The Amazing Race of uh, go to the, the big open market, and then uh, you're going to prepare a meal, and we've already even seen it on this season. Yeah, it's a popular... Mm -hmm feature on the amazing race because almost every city has one of these. yeah is it a good feature is this exciting <sighs> it's exciting because it's chaotic and because mm -hmm. it puts you directly in contact with oh, locals where yeah, i would take a i would take a go to the market and get the ingredients task over a task celebrating the quote-unquote nightlife of a city when it's just a bunch of extras in a room. I would take, I would take the market every single time. <laughs> Mike, how do you feel about market challenge? I love market challenges. Maybe that's just, uh, you know, li lasting from my love of supermarket sweep, but I think it's an interesting way for them to interact with the locals as well, and it is a bit throwing them into the chaos. It's like back when they used to do the India legs where they really tried to throw them just in the middle of swarms of people to really get them overwhelmed and make them feel like, okay, we're not really in Kansas anymore. And then they added a sort of extra effect on here as well where they sort of combine not only the shopping roadblock, but the, you know, make this delicacy slash, you know, uh, make the ladle part two roadblock, where they also had to <laughs> make the Rolex and serve it up as well, which some of these teams proved they could do one, but not necessarily the other. Yeah. Okay, so teams are <laughs> looking for ingredients. They're, they're going to be uh, cooking. Uh, it seems like just that the hard part was uh, rolling out the dough. 
It seemed like it, although Victor had a moment uh, uh. where he was the butterfly mean guy, where he holds up a tomato and says, is this a tomato? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It almost felt deliberate uh, with that. But let me just say that after I watched this, I Googled what is a Rolex sandwich, and I then I Googled where can I order chapati bread on Seamless. Oh, you're going to make this. I, I might have to. Uh, yeah. Because... I think, okay, you guys know how Josh Wiggler is about pizza. Yes. Mm-hmm. I am kind of that way about <laughs> breakfast sandwiches. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I know that. I feel like I could eat bodega breakfast sandwiches for <laughs> every meal, and I would be totally satisfied with that. Yeah. So when someone basically gives you a task that is make a breakfast sandwich, oh. I'm like, yeah, I, I would not only do that, but I probably wouldn't hand over the sandwich at the end of the task. I would probably eat it. Can they eat it? Or is it like, nope, you have to give it to the guy? I'm surprised nobody asked. Like, I'm really surprised because I remember thinking back to like season 25 where you had Robin, hey. special wrestler, and every oh, single task they're at, he's like, can I take this? Can I eat it? Can I eat it? <laughs> and he's always got a piece we of food in his hand. Or, okay. or Gus with the beer back in season six. Yeah, exactly. Like, how, how do people get through beer tasks and not drink the beer? <laughs> I, I'm so intrigued by this naming, because this is another swerve, okay. but this is more of a cultural swerve <laughs> than a race swerve. So, nice. it's, is it really called Rolex because it's short for rolled eggs? <laughs> Does that really sound like that's why they would name it that? 100%. Well, so do they speak English in Uganda? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They, so, I yeah, mean, they, they speak many local... Other local dialects as well, but the English, I think, is the national language. Yeah. I mean, the word Rolex was spelled out on the uh, thing, so it makes sense that, you know, it wasn't like uh, any sort of uh, different spelling or anything like that. Right. So I guess the question is, like, do you think they, the people who created this and make these mean to get confused for watches? Is that bringing in business? That, that you're looking for a watch? Oh, happen to sit down and eat our breakfast burrito? Yeah. I don't think that happens a lot in Uganda. Yeah, I'm not sure. Much. Yeah. Not sure how many people in Uganda are familiar with the uh, Rolex timepiece either. Probably full. Uh, but we might as well segue. <laughs> this is a very nice segue, actually, into the second of our Amazing Race 101 segments. Hit it, Mike. Amazing Race 101. <laughs> okay, so. Amazing Race, what is the first rule of Amazing Race, guys? Always read the clue. Yes, very good, Rob. (laughs) (laughs) That's what everybody loves. Yeah, that's what everybody loves. First rule of Amazing Race, always read your clue. Clearly not everybody loves that. (laughs) Um, So... We need to give people Actually, a little for bit of background. Chris, should we revise the rule, Jess, of uh, rule number one is always get the clue? <laughs> <laughs> Find the clue, then read it. Yeah, then, yes. then read it. We can't do one without the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think we need to tell people <sighs> out there listening who, for whom this is their first season of Amazing Race, we need to tell people a little bit more about what happens when you rip that clue open and you take out the paper. Because... I don't think it's 100% clear when you're just watching, and you think, like, I think what happens ultimately is a lot, looks a lot stupider than it is, although sometimes it can be pretty stupid. So, basically, when you open your clue, you will have a sheet of paper that is folded up, and you'll have the main sheet of paper with the logo of whatever the next task is. It'll be a detour, or a roadblock, or head-to-head, or... Or even uh, root info is the one that's kind of default, like go to the next location. Hmm. So if you open up a task and it has a roadblock logo on it, there's going to be a short sentence on that clue, typically. And same for detour, it'll just have like the two options with a little brief description of them. So you open the roadblock task and it says, who wants to find a Rolex? And that's the only thing you have to go on to decide who's going to take the roadblock. Although if you're at the task and you can see other people doing the roadblock, you can kind of gauge what it is and who should do it. But sometimes literally all you see, you see that one sentence that says, you know, who's who's ready to find a Rolex? You choose the person. And from there, once you've chosen who can do the roadblock, you can't go backsies on it. 
at that point, you can open up the sheet of paper that has the more detailed instructions, which mm -hmm. you typically do not see on screen at any point. So that sheet of paper will have all the rules of what you need to do to complete the task, um, where you need to go to get started, and mm -hmm. what will constitute completing the task. That's all compliance. That's like game show uh -huh. law. And this will typically be pretty detailed. But if you don't look at it, then you're not going to know what you're supposed to do. And I think this is the problem that we saw here with the confusing the watch for the sandwich, because I think the very first thing on that sheet of paper was surely the traditional Ugandan <laughs> delicacy of the Rolex sandwich. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, she was not the only person to confuse the two. I know Victor was the one to, again, really point out that oh. roll plus eggs equals Rolex. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, we don't eat those in Oobly, babe. Uh, but I think that, I, I guess Janelle, I think it was just an unfortunate storm of factors where, yes, maybe she didn't read that additional information, but I don't understand why. I mean, she was in it at a certain point. She probably got there, what, like fifth or sixth? Why did she not see what the other people are doing? realize, oh, we're cooking something, and decides, nope, I need to go look for this watch. Clearly that has to do something with what we're eventually cooking. Yeah, that, that boggles my mind. I think at that point she may have gotten lost in the market, mm -hmm. and I think she didn't know where anybody else was. But they got there, they got their clue, there may not have been other racers around. So she takes off in the market, and then she doesn't know how to get back to where she is to find that stand. I think that might be what happened, and then at that point she's flustered, she's not looking at what it actually is, she's not stopping and rereading it, and I think this is an important thing for anybody that thinks they might someday go on The Amazing Race, and you know, Rob, that might be you someday, Maybe. so pay attention. Okay. If you're in this situation where you have no idea what the F you're supposed to do at a given time, stop and take a deep breath and read every single word of every single sheet of paper that came in that little envelope. That's Stephen's job. That's He's the, the reader. Job. Yeah, you don't have to read anything, Rob, unless you're on the unless you're doing the roadblock oh, yeah. and you can't find Stephen. So you need this is for you to do. <laughs> you can't count on Stephen to carry you through the whole game. I'm more of a visual learner. Yeah, well, they have a demo. You okay. can usually watch the demo, but that's I think that's if you get caught up in something like this. I think the first step is always to get that clue out and reread it from top to bottom again. And that will hopefully set you right. And that's something that Janelle could have benefited from in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. There's also going to be a speed bump here on uh, this leg for Rachel and Alyssa, and they're going to be forced to do some laundry. You know, Mike, back in the day on the Big Brother, the Big Brother contestants actually had to do laundry by hand. Does that mean our next speed bump is going to be throwing CDs into a pool? <laughs> Wait, yeah. what do they do now? Or uh, take care of a potbelly pig? So I, th I think that they, uh, I think by like Big Brother two or three, they added a dryer to the backyard. Uh, yeah, but they used to have, they used to have a clothesline. Yeah, uh, I think that either their laundry gets sent out or uh, they have a washing machine. Also, that being said, I am. 85% sure they just did the cruise laundry. Like, you'd have to imagine the crew is just like, all right, two birds with one stone, let's get them to wash our clothes, and that's why there was so much of it. Well, just Phil, why not? Phil made it sound like, uh, in this speed bump, that uh, the team, Rachel and Alyssa are going to have to do laundry, and then they're going to have to find a place to dry it, and good luck in this market. But the, the clothesline was was right above where they where the thing was. It was This was not a hard part of the challenge. Well, they're, they're, no speed bump is ever as hard as Phil makes it sound. Do you know one time that they made them eat ice cream for a speed bump? And they still left it up. <laughs> <laughs> Phil made it sound like, boy, uh, it, it is slim pickings for clothesline space in this market. <laughs>